Welcome, and thank you all for holding. I'd like to inform parties that your lines have been placed on a listen-only mode until the question and answer portion. To ask a question at that time, please press star 1. Today's conference is also being recorded. If anyone has any objections, you may disconnect. If anyone needs operator assistance, please press star then zero. I'll now turn the conference over to your host, Congressman Rob Andrews. You may begin. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is Rob Andrews representing New Jersey's 1st District, co-chair of the Democratic Steering and Policy Committee. Uh, in nine days, a self-inflicted wound is about to be uh, launched at the U.S. economy. The so-called sequester. Uh, over time will cost between 700,000 and three-quarters of a million American jobs. In my district, uh, as I've been traveling about, I've heard all about this. I've heard defense uh, contract employees at Lockheed Martin wondering if they'll be laid off. I've heard uh, businesses that run transportation contracting firms that are building roads, train stations, other transportation projects, wondering whether those projects will be terminated or interrupted by the sequester. I've talked to federal employees who work for the IRS, various other departments, the USDA of the federal government, wondering if they'll be furloughed or laid off. I've heard from people at my hospitals who are concerned that Medicare payments will drop, which means that revenues will drop, which means that layoffs will be made necessary there. This is an unnecessary self-inflicted wound to the United States economy. Congress should come back to Washington and fix the problem. Tomorrow, the Democratic Steering and Policy Committee will be having a hearing to talk about some of the impacts we're seeing around the country due to this self-inflicted wound, and also the Democratic response. Uh, our budget leader, Congressman Chris Van Hollen, working with Sandy Levin and the Ways and Means Committee, Nita Lowy, the Appropriations Committee, has put forward a plan that would keep us on path to a balanced budget, continue the progress toward reducing the deficit, but not put three-quarters of a million American jobs at risk. We have on us uh, on the call today a, a number of leaders from our caucus that are going to talk about what they're hearing at home, what they believe we should do to avoid this self-inflicted wound. And we'll start with the ranking Democratic member on the full appropriations committee, the general lady from New York, Nita Lowy. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Rob Andrews, uh, co-chair of the Steering and Policy Committee, for putting this call together. I am very concerned, as well as all of my constituents, about this unnecessary sequester. Most of the people don't even understand what sequester means. But those who are employing thousands of people get it. For example, I've been approached by the head of our large hospitals, which serve the whole metropolitan New York area. My district is Westchester and Rockland, but of course millions of people commute for work into Manhattan every single day. At one of the hospitals, they are getting over $185 million for research, cancer, Alzheimer's, autism. It's important to note there are several large hospitals such as this who are getting research grants from the NIH. Now, the impact here is not only that many researchers won't be able to continue their work, and have a devastating effect on research into cancer, Alzheimer's, autism, and so much more. But these are jobs. Research affects the economy in the whole metropolitan region. People commute to work to do this important research and to cut across the board. To have the sequester takes place, affecting the National Institutes of Health is not only important research, but it means jobs. I also want to say many people fly into New York and out of the New York region. Air traffic controllers will be laid off. This, again, has a devastating effect on the economy. Planes will be slowed down. Fewer planes will be able to fly. This is so unnecessary. I want to remind everybody on this call that in the Budget Control Act, which has the force of law, 
there was a cut over the next 10 years of $1.5 trillion. And this is real. And the important thing is we can selectively decide where we cut, not mindlessly across the board. We should be back in Washington. I'm glad there's going to be a hearing tomorrow. We should get to work, everybody in the same room, and put together a plan that doesn't put in place mindless cuts that has devastating effects on the economy. As Mr. Andrews said, loss of millions of jobs. Thank you, Rob. Nita, thank you very much. One of the members who's seen up close the potential devastation of these cuts is from the Tidewater area in Virginia. He's developed expertise over the years on budget matters. He's with us on this call, Congressman Bobby Scott from Virginia. Thank you, thank you, Rob. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Rob. And it's a pleasure to be with, on the phone with you and Nita, John, and Matt. Uh, I live in um, the Hampton Roads area of Virginia. It's a heavily military area, and the sequester will have a devastating effect. Even in the non-military area, we're hearing from Head Start programs, uh, uh, meatpacking plants in the area, the airports, whether there will be enough air traffic controllers, FBI, uh, NASA Langley is located in this area, Jefferson Lab, all will be adversely affected by the uh, by the sequester, but the Department of Defense, uh, it's a heavily a heavy concentration of, of military in the area, military bases and contractors such as the Newport News uh, shipyard. They will be seriously affected by the uh, uh, by the sequester. Last night we had a town hall meeting where I had one of the leading economists in the area give a presentation on the impact it would have, and his calculation is that the reduction in defense. Uh, in, in Department of Defense spending alone, just the Department of Defense, the reduction in the regional gross uh, GDP is about the same as the loss in GDP for the area during the recession of 2008 and 2009. In other words, if the sequester goes through and the Department of Defense withdraws the kind of money that's anticipated to be withdrawn, it will have the equivalent effect of the, uh, of the of the of the recession, and it'll put uh, our area in the same uh, situation it was in in 2008 and 2009. Uh, we can't the, the savings um, won't even save any money. I mean, our shipyards are extremely efficient. Um, the apprentice schools, for example, time their graduation so that when the graduates when when the students graduate. They graduate right when the work is needed. They time their jobs so that one, when one job ends, the next one begins. Uh, subcontractors all over the country will know when, when parts are needed. When you delay a refueling that's going on right now, we expected one of the ships to come in uh, for, for a refueling uh, last week. We don't know when it's going to come in. When you do that, you just mess up everything. You don't, The subcontractors don't know what to do. Um, uh, it will be delayed. It may be delayed when the next job is is to come in. This job may still be sitting in the dry dock, holding up things. And everybody is uh, wasting time. Uh, they're doing. They're waiting for the work to come. They're being paid, but they're not getting any work. Uh, we that, that just causes a, con- a lot of confusion. And the uh, things that will be cut by the military. A lot of things you can't change. I mean, if you sign the lease, you can't tell your landlord, "Well, I, I just going to pay. I'm going to pay you 10 percent less rent." The things that you can actually do something about: maintenance, training, uh, canceling contracts, or subcontractors don't know what's going on. Uh, you really won't be saving anything, but cutting back on training and maintenance, uh, you're just making things worse and more expensive for the future. It's the old oil filter commercial: "You can pay me now, or you can pay me later." Cutting back in maintenance and training is not a good thing to do. Uh, local contractors, have already, some of them have already sent out uh, so-called warn letters, uh, the required uh, a statutory notice that there may be a major layoff. So everybody is, um, uh, is, is, is concerned. Uh, we need to do something about this. Uh, we need to get together. We do not need to be in our districts. We need to be in Washington. Being on recess during this period is absolutely Absurd. One of the questions that came up during the during the town hall meeting: uh, what, Why are you on uh, vacation when you ought to be at work? And I, you have to acknowledge. I said, 
I just responded, it, we should be at work. It's going to be hard. If you want to have a substitute for $1.2 trillion sequester, uh, you have to come up with some alternative that's not as bad as the sequester. And the number is so huge that it will be, it'll be very difficult to do it without uh, new revenues. Uh, there are a lot of different ideas out there, how you can come up with revenues, have a balanced approach to have some significant portion of the sequester offset by revenues. But you can't decide this in a, in a one- or two-day session. We need to be at work. We need to be talking uh, to, to, to each other and coming Bobby, up with a solution. Bobby, thank you, and, and we agree that Speaker Boehner should call the Congress back into session. We should act to avoid this self-inflicted loss of three quarters of a million jobs and someone who's observing that problem in the state of Maryland is Congressman John Sarbanes who's with us on the call. Thanks a lot Rob. I appreciate your pulling this call together. Um, good morning everybody. I want to, I'm going to be pretty brief because um, I think some very good points have been made but I want to follow up on something that Bobby Scott just said. When I talk to my constituents, when I interact with people out there, they're absolutely incredulous that we are on recess when this sequester issue is hanging over us. They, they fundamentally cannot understand why the Republican majority in the House would have people go home when there's only days left before this sequester will take effect with the incredibly disruptive impact that that will have. And the disruption is going to be felt um, in terms of the federal government, uh, the federal workforce, and I have a particular perspective on that, being from Maryland. We have over 130,000 federal employees uh, in the state of Maryland. Um, and many of them are doing uh, very, very essential work. And those, even those essential functions are going to be threatened by the sequester. We have so the Social Security Administration is located in Baltimore. Those are the folks who process beneficiary and disability claims for tens of millions of Americans. In some instances already understaffed, now you're going to come along with a meat axe and do the sequester maneuver on that part of the federal workforce. The impact is going to be felt by regular folks out there across the country. So when you talk about cuts to the federal government, you're really talking about cuts to the infrastructure that supports millions and millions of Americans out there when it comes to critical functions that they depend on. So it's going to be disruptive to the government. It's going to be disruptive to private employers. It's disruptive to uh, consumers. And it's overall disruptive to the economic recovery that we're trying to achieve. So people simply cannot understand why it is that we would be back in our districts instead of in Washington. And the Democrats are going to convene there tomorrow with the Steering and Policy Committee. And thank you, Rob, for helping to make that happen, because we think the discussion needs to be happening right now. The Democrats in both the Senate and the House have put forward a very balanced proposal for how you can avoid this sequester, um, one that draws on new revenues and also identifies in a sensible way uh, where you can find cuts. People want us to be in Washington, and we're going to be there tomorrow to make the point that there is substantive legislation available that can solve um, this problem. Two other points real quick, and then I'll close. If you look at any of the recommendations from these different independent commissions and so forth, and there have been a variety of things that have come along, the details can be argued about, but the premise of every single one of them is that you have to have a balanced approach. You have to look at both revenues and savings. And unfortunately, the Republican majority in the House does not want to consider that balanced approach, and they brought us to this place uh, where the sequester is imminent. And that's why the discussion we're going to have tomorrow is so critical. And then finally, let me just say that when you detail for people what is in the proposal from Senate Democrats and from Chris Van Hollen and House Democrats in terms of what we can do to avoid the sequester, when you lay out the proposals, the balanced proposals, these are things that the overwhelming majority of Americans out there support. So if you want to ask the question, who, who is standing with their arms folded, sort of blocking the door 
of the democracy right now. It's the Republican Party in Congress, and they need to bring us back into Washington, take up these bills, and engage in some responsible action to avoid the sequester. John, thank, thank you, Rob. You, you, John, thank you. You know, it's one thing to disagree with our plan, which is balance between revenue and spending cuts, which would avoid the sequester and avoid the loss of three-quarters of a million jobs. But it's quite another thing to refuse to even put it up for a vote. The Republicans are off in their districts. Some of them are on vacation. Some of them are off at various places around the country and the world. And these impending layoffs are only nine days away. To discuss the impact of that on his district, one of our newest members from northeastern Pennsylvania is Congressman Matt Cartwright. Matt, welcome. Oh, thanks, Rob. Uh, I am a freshman member of Congress, and uh, this is my first time uh, in public service. Uh, to me, uh, it's astonishing uh, that we are in recess this week uh, with nine days to go before these draconian automatic cuts take place. Uh, to me, um, it's like the airplane we're flying is going down, and we're taking a break to watch the in-flight movie. Now, I'm from the 17th Congressional District of Pennsylvania. That, that's uh, northeastern Pennsylvania, Scranton, Wilkes-Barre, Easton, Pottsville. We have uh, a very important military installation in our district. It's the Toby Hanna Army Depot. And they do incredibly important communications uh, refurbishing work uh, for the Army there and have done for the last 60 years. Uh, that, the Toby Hanna Army Depot supports 5,200 workers, uh, and just looking at a proportional cut for those people, uh, we could lose uh, 600 jobs uh, or more from Toby Hanna uh, just from this sequester alone. Um, on Monday, I was at the General Dynamics Land Systems Division plant in Einan, Pennsylvania, that's E-Y-N-O-N. -N. Uh, the, the General Dynamics plant in Inan makes machine parts for Abrams tanks. Uh, they do incredible work there. Uh, I had a complete tour of the factory, uh, and all the way through the tour, the workers were stopping me, uh, members of the United Auto Workers, were, were asking me uh, what's going to happen with their jobs, uh, and what are we doing about this sequester? And I was dumbfounded because the House isn't doing anything. We're on vacation this week, uh, which is just uh, just amazing to me. So we're looking at something that uh, doesn't just impact jobs and the economy. I think a major point that must be made is that this is something that will be impacting our nation's military readiness. And more than that, it impacts social programs. Um, since I'm the only one from Pennsylvania on this call, uh, I'll tell you about the numbers for Pennsylvania. Title I grants to uh, lo local education associations. We're going to have 45,781 fewer students served from Title I because of this sequester. Head Start, 3,305 fewer children served. Cut out of the program. Veterans em Employment and Training. 750 fewer veterans served, just slashed because of this mindless sequester. Community service block grants, 43,889 fewer low-income individuals served by the community service block grants. Uh, uh, maternal and child health block grants, 95,342 fewer women and children and families served by the maternal and child health block grants. These are these are cuts that are mindless, they're blind, and they cut across not only our military readiness, but our entire spectrum of social services provided by the federal government. That's well, all I have. Thank you, Matt, very much. Thank you, my colleagues. And ladies and gentlemen, if you could direct your questions, we'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. If you would like to ask a question at this time, please unmute your phone and press star 1. Please record your name. To withdraw the request, please press star 2. 
Once again, star 1 at this time if you would like to ask a question. And one moment, please, for the first question. And our first question comes from Jonathan Strong. Your line is open. Um, hello. Thanks for doing this call. Uh, sure, Jonathan. Did, you, uh, did any of you stay in D.C. rather than travel home to your districts uh, to work on this? issue, and do you know of any other representatives, Democratic representatives, or senators who stayed in D.C. to work on this issue? Jonathan, our leadership has been talking about this on a daily basis, and our steering and policy committee will be in Washington tomorrow to have a hearing about this. I will tell you, without exception, Democrats are ready to be back in town with 24 hours' notice to take a vote and put this problem behind us. It's up to the Speaker. He's not done his job. We're ready to do ours. Uh, John, this is Matt Cartwright. I am in Washington, D.C. right now. Next question. Thank you. The next question comes from Phil Davis. Your line is open. Hi. Uh, you, <clears throat> the, the last senator spoke of uh, cuts to spending in education, and I, I kind of wanted to touch on that. Uh, there are a number of, of cuts across special, special education, child support enforcement, and uh, child care and develop, uh, development block grant. And I wanted to know, are there... Are you guys looking at rev revenue neutral ideas to not only keep those plans in there, or, or, but also be able to fund them over the long term? Uh, it, can you kind of address how you're going to atta tackle the education issue as part of yeah, the Yeah, the answer is the Democrats put forward a comprehensive substitute that would have cut uh, direct payments to huge agribusinesses, subsidies to huge oil companies, close the, uh, the uh, loophole that lets Wall Street hedge fund people pay lower tax rates than their personal assistance, and use that money to restore cuts in priorities like education, special education. The, the plan that Mr. Van Hollen put forward that we tried to put up for a vote on the House floor last week would have done all of that, avoided this mayhem to education, and it's what we should come back and vote on immediately. Next question. By the, by the way, I, this is John Sarbanes. Um, to reiterate something I said at the outset, when you talk to average Americans out there um, about what's in the proposal the Democrats have put forward, they support these things in overwhelming majorities. I mean, if they're given the choice between eliminating a subsidy for big oil on the one hand, right, or having to go um, cut Head Start programs on the other, they're going to choose eliminating a subsidy that frankly can't be justified anymore. So the, the, the contrast is very clear in terms of what's been put forward. Uh, by the Democrats versus what the sequester would impose. And the fact that the Republicans don't yeah. want to entertain that conversation, I think, um, speaks to where their values are on the budget. Exactly right. And, and as John said, that the contrast is not simply between how we would reduce the deficit and how they would. We would take action. They wouldn't. We want to come back to Washington and vote to end the sequester. They don't. And I think that's a contrast the American people understand quite well. Next question. Thank you. That comes from Ed O'Keefe with the Washington Post. Your line is open. Uh, Congressmen and Congresswomen, thank you for doing this. Um, I'm curious if any of you have made specific requests or pleas to certain federal agencies or perhaps even the White House to somehow protect programs uh, in your specific districts, whether it's making sure there's enough air traffic controllers for the New York skies or a certain military program that might adversely affect a contracting firm in your district? Yeah, I, I, I think Mrs. Lowy is probably best to answer that. She's been our leader in trying to be sure all of these cuts could be avoided by working through the appropriations process. Nita, would you like to answer that? Certainly, and, and if I understand the, correctly, uh, the question correctly, uh, the reason we're so concerned is the tremendous impact on the areas you mentioned, such as air traffic controllers. But I have not, and I don't know that anyone, has made specific requests. Either we deal with the issue in a thoughtful way, or we have to subject everyone to the sequester and do it across the board. But I think it would be absolutely wrong if one or more of us were trying to get a special uh, treatment for one part of uh, the budget that affects our own constituency. The reason we're working so hard 
to try and get rid of the sequester and not do across the board is it's so mindless that way. We should be looking at the whole budget and make thoughtful cuts and make uh, suggestions for thoughtful revenue. We, uh, we don't believe in divide and conquer. We believe in unite and resolve, and that's what we're trying to do here. Next question. The next question comes from Janet Hook with the Wall Street Journal. Your line is open. Hello. Uh, thanks for doing this call. Um, one idea that I've heard discussed, um, if it came to actually the sequester taking effect, is the idea of Congress passing a law, that, a bill that would give agency heads more discretion and flexibility in distributing the cuts. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering how you folks would feel about that. I know yeah. your first priority is to block the sequester, but if yeah, it came I mean, to that, would you favor giving agency heads more discretion? I don't think we could get to that point, Janet, for this reason. Our first priority is to come back into session and actually start dealing with the problem at all. So to, to get into modifications to the sequester is something I don't think we want to do. We want to come back to Washington, put our voting cards in, and vote on plans that would eliminate the need for the sequester. And I think to just tweak it is, is not enough to save three-quarters of a million jobs. The other thing is, this is John Sarbanes in Maryland, what you hear from people is there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty out there. Um, the number one thing when you talk to small businesses, large businesses for that matter, when you talk to consumers is they want this uncertainty about sort of the economic forecast and about budgeting to be resolved. So kind of nibbling around the edges of something that continues to be dysfunctional and broken isn't going to address that uncertainty issue. The way you address that is you bring us back to Washington. You have us... Um, tackle these problems, you know, um, in a serious way and try to resolve them and put in place something that gives gives the, uh, the economy some certainty going forward. And so the proposals that you talk about, um, I'm not sure would address that. We want to see real certainty here. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, I think we, we have time for maybe one more. I am showing no further questions on the phone line. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank Nita Lowy, who has done painstakingly difficult work to get our appropriations message out, and I hope that she's able to actually pass appropriations bills that are fully funded. Bobby Scott, who's outlined the devastating effect on the Tidewater area in particular, not just in military but in other services. John Sarbanes, who I think made a very important point about Social Security, how it is at risk. Uh, if the sequester kicks in, and then Matt Cartwright, who expresses for all of us the incredulity of being out of session and out of touch while this problem looms, and we appreciate all of you participating. I again invite you tomorrow at 2.30 to cover the hearing of the Democratic Steering and Policy Committee, where we're going to hear from a wide array of witnesses about the consequences of this job loss to our country, why we should avoid it, and we'll be discussing again the Democratic plan to, in a balanced and sensible way, avoid this self-inflicted wound to our economy. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time this afternoon. We appreciate it. Thank you. This does conclude the conference. You may disconnect at this time. Have a great day.